extract all the food information. We're, a we're able, able to create a, data a database for each of these traditional food. So each of this is put into a category of four. The first one's an Apache, the second one's scientific, the next one's English, and what, how, what it's used for and how is it cooked and what do you do with it. And that's a data system that took about 30 years to, to actually develop and create. So it took a lot of work and it's, well, it's uh, open to our community members to have access to it and helps those that don't have um, elders or they don't have a uh, auntie or relative to help reintroduce some food. If not, I go out on field trips three times a week and reintroduce people to food that they've never met. Seeds of Native Health Conference, and her program was featured in a film called Gather um, that was produced in partnership with uh, First Nations Development Institute and, and a private funder. But um, her experience with the Tribal Food Sovereignty Program um, is very profound, and I'm sure that everyone could feel that here today. Um, so I'll go ahead and move into the question and answers portion of our presentation. But I would like to have a show of hands. How many people in this room have a food sovereignty project already at their tribe? OK, that's great, because that's less than half. So um, again, we are moving information to you all. We are sharing information in a way that is, is a best practices approach for folks to adopt. Um, so I really hope that you've learned something here today and really want to foster and generate some um, a, a catalyst around questions and answers. So please take this time to ask our, while you have, you know, we have a captive audience and we have these wonderful programs captivated here today, please take the time to answer some questions. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Phil Haas, this is Shooting, Sute Squaha, Suyap, Fun Shooting, Tony Singer. I'll be quick, but I want to add some value to this because I've been in this area for over a decade now, and that knowledge needs to go somewhere. But first of all, I want to thank all of the presenters. This was a very touching and educational panel, and thank you, Chelsea, for putting this together. But I wanted to tell you, in all the years that I've been working with Tribe, the recommendations that we give them when they want to move into food sovereignty, and that is look within your community, within your elder community and your, um, your medicine people. But then also you mentioned First Nations. They do Food Sovereignty Summit, our Sovereignty Assessment. They have a toolbox. You don't have to go through them to use it, but they provide the toolbox online. And that's a good start. And then don't forget to reach out to your education extension offices because almost all of you are connected to a university that could offer you free services for part of your um, food sovereignty assessment, but also soil science, um, any type of studies, veterinary services, all of this be provided to you for free. But also, what I work, I work now for the Native American Agriculture Fund, and we give money out. And we give money out as indigenous people to other indigenous people, so we're not gonna judge you like a federal grant would judge you. We are looking for what's important in your community, and we are, looking at agriculture broadly, not, not it, it's not just um, cows. <laughs> We're looking at agriculture for fishermen, fisherwomen. We're looking at it for your medicinal plants that you want to keep in your community, or maybe you want to market it to sell to your local community. It's very broad. We just did our first round of funding, but we are going to do these fun cycles for the next 19 years. So stay tuned for an announcement um, going into the new year of our new funding partners that will be part of our first round. But I also have two questions. So Lauren mentioned that it's hard to get information from different federal partners. And I have the opportunity to present next week in Tennessee at the National Agriculture Census Conference. And they want to know what the country needs. And I've already talked to Lauren about this briefly, but I want you to uh, mention again what we talked about in California. But we need to know what data is missing or how we could quantify not only through 
the math and the numbers, but the qualitative part that you said, if you bring a hunter out and they come back the next year and want to hunt, those are the types of things that I can relay to the census to let them know, include those types of questions in the Nets agricultural census, because those are how we judge, how we measure in our indigenous communities success. So uh, we had a conversation on some of those data gaps, and so uh, as we think about even you know Western resources, right, or resources that come through um, uh, USDA or, or whatever it may be, um, it, it's very difficult as you um, as you stack on top the the um, uh, complexities around trust line management to actually gain eligibility for many of those programs. So as we think about you know, data that allows us to create our own standards, right? You know, we're in the process of creating our own standards for organic, for grass-finished, um, medicinal plants, traditional foods, native seeds. It then puts us in a position to be able to protect those resources because we don't have criminal jurisdiction over non-natives, but we do have civil jurisdiction. But you have to have a code in place. So as we think about the, the types of uh, data that really um, mm -hmm. uh, supplement those efforts, you know, we want to know what the probability is for a Blackfeet farmer or rancher uh, to gain access to a FSA loan or to an equip contract versus a non-native, right? You know, because we know that there's already a, a huge disparity. But uh, when we think about data and how we utilize data to really uh, not only um, uh, supplement what we're doing on the ground, but to substantiate, it's very necessary. So when I think about some of that data um, um, uh, and, and some of that those data gaps, Right, you know, it's um, it's the substantiation piece for us that is really necessary that allows us to move into that space. Okay, um, thank you. I really enjoyed all the presentations today. So, um, this is for any one of you who want to respond to it, but because uh, I think you all have a, a very similar take on one from what I've heard. But one of the questions that I've become more and more engaged in as I've worked in native agriculture issues for the last four or five years and um, more recently with the Native American Agriculture Fund. But right now, I'm when I hear the word food sovereignty, and I think if you all agree with me that if you line up 10 Native Americans from different parts of the country and ask them what that definition is, you'll get 10 different answers. And it, do you see that as an issue that needs to be um, more refined, or do you think it's an expression of the diversity of ways in which people are exercising their sovereignty, and we shouldn't narrow how we talk about it? Because I think that's kind of the challenges that we're having right now, because not only are we talking in our own communities, but we're talking to each other, we're talking to other tribes and organizations like this, but we're also talking to the industry. We're talking to states, we're talking to the federal agencies. <clears throat> And we're not clear on what that definition is. How can we expect everyone to understand this? Do you see that as a problem, or do you think that's just something they're going to have to adjust to? Well, whatever. Whenever you're dealing with a federal agency, it's always a problem sometimes, the interpretation of it. However, I want us to be very um, respectful with acknowledging the diversity in the tribes, and they're still sovereign nations. And so when you look at food sovereignty, it still relates to the rights to build or adapt food systems that include their culture and their ways and their people. So however it's um, dissipated, is different. Some may start with youth, some may start with concepts, some may start with a food center, some may start with an academic concept in it, but regardless of, it's still the basic crux of indigeneity and also tied to that culture and anchor. So I think we're going to have to explain it to the government always in the same way that we started looking at USDA grants that did not include tribes, but they included nonprofits, but not tribes. And we kept going back and back and back to the federal government for that. So we need to make sure that they respect us 
in our practices versus forcing us to align to them. And I just want to add on to that. Loud. I just want to add on to that as well. You know, I think that, you know, when you look at um, the ability for tribes to truly be sovereign, right, you know, we're never going to move into that space if we continue to conform to everything else. So when we think about a Western context, right, you know, I mean, you know, it's, a, you know, a, a round peg in a square hole, right, you know, because we think and we have, you know, even in our methodologies for harvesting, right, we have sustainability built in, right, you know, so we know that everything that we do, as long as we utilize our own methodologies to, to inform what we do in a modern context, we know that the sustainability is already there. Right? So when we think about you know, the, the conversation around true food sovereignty, if we're not thinking about how we utilize that to create the foundation for tribal sovereignty, right, then we're missing the boat entirely because it does offer us the opportunity to really redefine things and align them with the practice of who we are as Native people. And so I think that that's really an integral part in all of our efforts. You know? and so, so to answer your question directly, I think that that's up to the tribe or the tribal government to, to answer that question, right, you know, and to move into that space and, and create that space for themselves, right, you know, and by doing so, you'll then see, you know, uh, modern management concepts that are informed by the practice of who we are rather than us trying to fit in our management practices with a, a, a infrastructure that isn't conducive to who we are. And I'll, I'll add a comment on that. Um, so NCAI defines food sovereignty as, um, well, we work to empower, right, the tribes and each sovereign. So uh, we, we define it as a way that each tribe has the self-determination to define what food sovereignty means to them. Because when we start to talk about sovereignty, we're um, addressing ourselves as individual sovereigns, as, as individual nations in our government-to-government -government relationship um, with the federal government and so what are we talking about now we're talking about policies and we're looking at the very broad spectrum of policies that affect this work right so we're talking about climate action policy agriculture policy land policy um, land tenure um, water policy and those are that I mean that full gamut of policy is is very broad so it really makes sense to keep it broad I think in this aspect That's I, I, I think I had more than a comment. I just want to say, Lauren, Lauren and I, we both went to Chamawa. And so um, when we're at Chamawa, my name's Freddie 